We'll discuss these papers in this video. They're available from the IEEE and ACM digital libraries. Scheduling is at the heart of high-performance embedded computing systems. Schedulers allocate system resources to ensure that tasks meet their deadlines. They also have to take into account other factors such as power consumption or resource contention. In this video, we'll study a range of techniques used to analyze and design schedulers for embedded computing systems. We'll concentrate here on the single processor case. Let's start with some terminology on models of computation, on problem definition, and on metrics. Here's an execution of a process. The request time is the first time at which the process is allowed to execute. It has to finish by its deadline. If the task executes periodically, we refer to this as the period. The execution time may be split up among several different separate executions. The response time is the time from when the process is first released to when it completes. Some real-time models allow data dependencies between tasks. In this case, P3 cannot start until both P1 and P2 finish and pass their data on to P3. Generally speaking, the deadline would apply to the entirety of this task graph. All three processes must finish by the deadline. We'd like metrics to help us evaluate the quality of a schedule. Here's a simple example with several different processes, their computation times, and we'll consider how they execute over an interval from T1 to T2. A very simple but effective metric is utilization. For each task i, we find the computation time for the ith task and divide it by the length of that time interval. We then add up all these contributions from the individual tasks to find the total utilization. This gives us a number between 0 and 1. We often express that as a percentage from 0 to 100%. Clearly, we cannot use more than 100% of the CPU. Priority-based scheduling is a foundation for real-time scheduling. Priorities allow system designers to specify the importance of tasks to the scheduler so the scheduler can then properly allocate resources. Let's start by considering the states through which processes cycle during execution. We'll then see how execution is affected by priorities, and we will consider static versus dynamic assignment of these priorities. An operating system controls the execution of tasks. As far as the operating system is concerned, each task or process can be in one of three states. It can be waiting. It's not yet ready to start executing. It can be ready to run. It has its data. It's in a new period, but it's not actually running on the processor. Or it can be running. In the case of a single processor system, one task at a time is running. Let's use a simple example to see how we use priorities to manage which task is actually running. So here we have one task. Let's give it priority one. Here we have another task of priority two, and we split its execution into two pieces. The operating system divides time into quanta. The quanta is the unit of time in the schedule one task runs on the processor in a time quantum. At the next time quantum, a different task may run. Let's look at execution starting with the first time quantum. 
Right now, the Priority 2 task is running. The Priority 1 task is waiting. This continues until this point. Now, the Priority 1 task is running, while the Priority 2 task is waiting. We go ahead in time, and now, once again, the Priority 2 task is running. The Priority 1 task is waiting again. Scheduling algorithms can use priorities in either of two ways. A static priority scheduler does not change the priorities of the task during execution. That means that you can compute the schedule offline. Dynamic priorities change during execution. We need to compute the schedule online while the system is running. Many, if not most, embedded systems include tasks that execute periodically. Periodic scheduling has been studied since the 1970s. We'll consider here three periodic scheduling algorithms. Rate monotonic, earliest deadline first, and least laxity. We can illustrate rate monotonic scheduling using this example. Task P1 has computation time C1 and its period goes from here to here, which we call T1. Here's another execution of P1. Here's P2. It has a somewhat longer deadline. And its period T2. And of course, its computation time, C2. In this example, we've set the priority of P1 to be higher than the priority of P2. That means that so long as P1 is executing, P2 cannot execute. And you see here, in the first interval, P1 finishes before P2 starts. In the next period, P1 executes and finishes for its period before P2 starts. We can add a third task. Here's its deadline, which is much longer than either of the first two. Here's some of the execution, and we're going to set P3 to have the lowest priority of any of these tasks. So it has to wait for both P1 and P2 before it can execute. So in this case, it's completed some of its execution, but it's not done for its work for this period. But it can't execute again until P1 finishes again. We've set the priority of P3 to be below that of both P1 and P2. So in the beginning of this interval, both P1 and P2 need to execute before P3 can start. But in this case, P3 hasn't quite finished. So we're going to have to execute P1 again and P2 again before P3 can execute. Luckily, P3 finishes before its deadline. The total computation time for P3 for one period has two elements, C3A and C3B. So the total computation time for P3 over this one period is the sum of C3A and C3B. Rate monotonic scheduling makes several assumptions. No data dependencies between processes. The periods of the processes can have arbitrary relationships. There is no necessary ratio between them. We assume zero context switching time for the operating system. Each process is released at the start of its period. And the execution time in each period is fixed and known in advance. Given those assumptions, Lou and Leyland showed that the optimal priority setting for static priorities, for priorities that do not change during execution, is based on the periods. The shorter the period, the higher the priority. Lou and Leyland based their proof on the notion of a critical instant. Here's a set of three tasks, and here are their periods.
The critical instance for P3, the lowest priority task, is right here. It's ready to go, but all of its higher priority processes are also ready to go. So P3 has to wait for all of these executions before it can finish. We can write formulas for each of the cases, whether P1 has higher priority or P2 has higher priority. Let's consider them in more detail. In the formula for P1, this term counts the total number of times that C1 will execute within the period of T2. We multiply that by the execution time of P1 to get the total execution time of P1 during the interval T2. We then add in the execution time for P2 and all that has to be less than or equal to the period T2. If P2 has higher priority, then the execution times of P1 and P2 must both be less than the execution time of T1. Liu and Leyland showed that if the second inequality is true, the first one must also be true. But the converse is not the case. If the first inequality is true, that does not necessarily mean that the second one is also true. This tells us that giving the highest priority to P1 is the optimum policy. Liu and Leyland studied the utilization of large task sets where M is the number of tasks. They made some assumptions about the relative periods of tasks. They showed that as the number of tasks M tends towards infinity, the utilization reaches this value. This means that under these assumptions, the utilization of rate monotonic scheduling is not necessarily one. We have to give up some amount of utilization in order to guarantee static scheduling of our system. Lahoxi and colleagues analyzed utilization, which they called load, or L. A system is schedulable if and only if its load is less than or equal to one. They showed that in order to analyze a system like this, we don't have to look at the entire continuum of time, but only at the points at which periods end. The total load is the sum of the loads presented by each task i. For a task i, they consider all the higher priority tasks as well as i. This term determines the number of times that task j will execute in the interval. We multiply that by the execution time, sum up all the contributions, and divide by the period. We've seen that rate monotonic scheduling is a static priority algorithm. It assigns the highest priority to the task with the shortest deadline. In general, this does not achieve 100% utilization, although there are certainly cases where we can get to 100% with rate monotonic. Liu and Leyland also studied another scheduling algorithm, earliest deadline first. It's a dynamic priority algorithm. It assigns the highest priority to the task closest to its deadline. This is known as the relative deadline, D. To be schedulable, the process set must satisfy this inequality, which means that the utilization is less than or equal to one. Earliest deadline first can achieve 100% utilization, but it requires dynamic calculation of the schedule. Consider this example. At this point in time, these are the priorities of the processes. P1 has the highest priority because it's closest to its deadline. Move forward in time to here, and now P2 has the highest priority because it is closest to its deadline. When we move forward a little bit in time, we see that P1 once again has the highest priority because it's closest to its deadline. We have to go all the way out here to find a time at which P3 has the highest priority. Yet another scheduling algorithm makes use of laxity or slack, which is the remaining computation time until the deadline. Least laxity first scheduling gives priority to the process with the smallest laxity at each given time. That is not the same as giving priority to the process that's closest to its deadline. 
the CPU is not the only resource that the scheduler needs to take into account. Contention for other resources can cause a problem known as priority inversion. Let's see how priority inversion occurs and what we can do about it. Here's a timeline. Let's fill in some tasks. P1 is the highest priority task. P3 is a low priority task. P2 has an intermediate priority. During part of its execution, it uses this shared resource C, which is protected by a semaphore. The semaphore ensures that only one task at a time can use C. Now consider an example in which during its next execution, P1 wants to make use of C, right here. Unfortunately, P2 already has control of C, so P1 is not allowed to use C. This is known as priority inversion. In some cases, the operating system may allow P2 to continue executing, which would delay the execution of P1. But the worst case is that the operating system recognizes the priority of P1, but does not recognize that it's going to need to use that resource. If it starts P1, which then tries to grab C, the semaphore will prevent P1 from using C, which means that P1 will not be able to continue. Meanwhile, P2 can't run and finish using Z because it doesn't have the CPU anymore. This is a deadlock, which would cause the system to catastrophically fail. Shaw and co-authors studied solutions to the priority inversion problem. One approach is the priority inheritance protocol. In this case, when a process uses a semaphore, it inherits the priority of the highest priority process that can use that semaphore, but only for the duration of its use of the semaphore. A priority ceiling protocol takes into account the possibility of multiple semaphores. Each semaphore has its own priority ceiling, and the priority that would be required to obtain the semaphore depends upon the priorities of other locked semaphores. Grouping tasks based on their criticality to the overall system provides us an additional tool for managing complex embedded systems and for scheduling them. Modern high-performance embedded systems may contain hundreds of tasks, and if we have only priorities to describe the relationships between their executions, things may get very messy. Vestal proposed a criticality scheme in order to classify sets of tasks. Some tasks are in the high criticality group. For instance, steering in a car or the flight controls in an airplane. These are extremely important to the safe operation of the system. Other tasks may be assigned a lower criticality. The scheduler takes into account both the priority of a task as well as its criticality when making scheduling decisions. In a complex system, the tasks may actually vary in their execution time. We may need to run different combinations of tasks depending on what the system is doing. For example, when we're driving, what we need to do for city driving may be different from what we do for highway driving. The scheduler should take into account these variations in order to improve the efficiency of the CPU utilization. Criticality allows the scheduler to give more emphasis to higher criticality tasks while it's computing the schedule. Vestal proposed a variation of earliest deadline first for criticality-based scheduling. Offline, it schedules the high criticality jobs in early deadline first order and calculates slacks. At runtime, it selects the job depending on the state of the ready job queue. Lee and Barua recursively construct the priority order of tasks. They identify tasks as low priority based on available CPU time. Their algorithm is provably schedulable under some load conditions. In addition to the periodic scheduling we saw before, tasks can also be initiated sporadically 
either by outside events or by some internal computation. Sporadic tasks still need to meet deadlines. Let's see how we can analyze sporadic tasks. A sporadic task can start to execute at its arrival time. It has to finish by its deadline. In general, a sporadic task won't be able to execute starting exactly at its arrival time. The difference between the release time of the task and its arrival time is known as jitter. We usually specify a maximum allowable jitter for a task. Audsley and others analyze the response time of sporadic tasks. In this example, we're interested in the response time of task P2. The response time is known as R2 in this case. It has a release time and a deadline. A higher priority task, P1, also executes. This formula can be solved iteratively to find the response time of task I. The superscript shows the iteration count. At each iteration, we sum the computation time for task I, the blocking time for task I, and for each higher priority process, this term determines the number of times it will execute, and this term is the computation time for task J. This overall sum gives us the value for the next iteration, and we repeat until the solution stabilizes. So for the first iteration of the response time of task 2, we can plug in the numbers. In this case, the value of R2 for iteration 0 was 0. This gives us a value of 5 for the first iteration. We plug that back into the formula. We solve again, and we get the value 9. When we plug the new value of the response time into the formula again, we see that we get the same answer, which means that the solution has converged. If we want to add jitter to the analysis, we can do so very easily by adding another term to the formula. Power consumption is a key metric for embedded computing systems, and scheduling can have a big impact on total power consumption. Let's look at some models for power consumption. We'll then see how we can schedule efficiently when we have discrete voltages to work with, and we'll consider the influence of leakage on scheduling. Let's consider the behavior of a processor over time. Its power consumption is proportional to the square of the voltage. Its frequency, the speed at which it can run, is proportional to a power of V. As the voltage goes up, the frequency will go up, but the power consumption will also go up. So modern processors vary the voltage that's applied to the processor. They also vary the frequency at the same time in order to match the available performance at that voltage. By varying the voltage, we can trade off power consumption for necessary performance. This technique is known as DVFS, Dynamic Voltage and Frequency Scaling. This plot shows power and delay as a function of voltage. Here's delay as a function of voltage. Delay is the inverse of clock frequency. As we increase the power supply voltage, the delay goes down and the clock frequency goes up. Power consumption goes up with voltage. Our task must meet a deadline T. We can find the point on the delay curve that corresponds to T, and then find the power supply voltage that gives us exactly the desired delay. That voltage is known as V-ideal. If we choose to run the task faster, it will consume considerably more power because it's operating in a much larger power supply voltage. Many computer systems don't allow us to continuously vary the power supply voltage. We have to choose from a small set of discrete power supply voltages, in this case two, V1 and V2. In general, none of these discrete voltages will be at our V ideal for any given task. We can, however, use the two power supplies to meet our execution time goal. We execute at a lower voltage V1 for a certain amount of time, then we execute at the higher power supply voltage. The total execution time is divided into two sections, 
the X section at the lower power supply voltage and the remainder at the higher voltage. Can we do as well using two power supply voltages as we do at the ideal voltage? Can we find an X such that we get exactly the same power consumption? The answer is no. These formulas describe the delay and the energy consumption when running at V ideal. This formula describes the delay for two power supply voltages running at the lower voltage for time X. And this is the energy associated with that execution. Ishiara and Yasura showed that E1 is always less than E2. That means that two voltages can't be as efficient on energy consumption as the single ideal voltage. But what if we have even more voltages? Could we make up the difference? For example, run it at V1, a very low voltage, then run for a certain amount of time at a higher voltage V2, and then finish off at an even higher voltage V3. Ishiara and Yasura also showed that three voltages are never better than two voltages. So given a power supply with a limited set of discrete voltages, we pick the two voltages closest to our V ideal as our operating voltages. These two voltages will give us the minimum power consumption we can achieve given the limited set of power supply voltages that we have to work with. Leakage current and the associated power consumption is a major concern in modern processors. Dejerkar and others analyze the effect of leakage power consumption on scheduling. Their power model included three components. Dynamic power consumption as the logic operates, leakage power consumption, and overhead related to necessary logic. We reduce leakage current by turning off the processor. However, turning off the processor and turning it back on has costs of its own. We start up the processor, we then operate it for a certain amount of time, and then we shut it down. Both startup and shutdown cost energy, and at some point it isn't worth shutting down. We may be better off leaving the system running. The threshold time is the minimum amount of time for which it's worth shutting down the system. It's determined by the ratio of the shutdown energy to the idle power consumption. So when we schedule tasks, we don't want a lot of short shutdown times. We want to coalesce them into one large procrastination time. We can then execute and we can adjust our voltage in order to just meet our delay requirement. This formula relates the procrastination time and the desired execution time. Partition scheduling gives us a hierarchy that we can use to more efficiently manage complex embedded systems. In this section, we'll look at scheduling partition models and supply and demand functions that we can use to analyze the schedulability of these partitions. Hierarchical scheduling divides tasks into partitions. In this partition, we have two tasks, each with its own period and computation time they form partition one. Another partition will have a different set of tasks. Hierarchical scheduling provides an abstraction for the scheduler. It doesn't have to know all the details of the tasks inside each partition in order to schedule the partition itself. Here's an example with a period P. The blue regions are where this partition can execute. The other parts of the schedule are blocked from this partition. It cannot execute in those times. The availability function for this partition is determined by the end times and start times of each part of the partition's computations. Analyzing partition schedules is harder than analyzing a flat schedule. That's because deadlines continue to run even when the partition is blocked from executing. Within a partition, rate monotonic and earliest deadline first are still optimal for the static and dynamic priority cases. But when we look at the total execution, the EDF utilization bound does not apply. To analyze partitions, we'll develop two types of functions. 
a supply function and demand function. For the partition to be schedulable, the supply function has to be at least as large as the demand function for all time. Here's an example of a partition. We've shown it over two periods in order to simplify the graphical analysis. The endpoint of each segment of the partition is known as an interval base critical point, or IBCP. In this example, we have three IBCPs in one period. We can construct a supply function starting at the first IBCP. We'll then slide it over to time zero. We can construct another supply function starting at IBCP2. And we'll slide that over. We can find the third supply function from IBCP3 and slide it over. Given these supply functions, we can find a least supply function S star. This is the smallest resource availability over any interval of length t. Based on that, we can construct a critical partition. The task group is schedulable if and only if it is feasible in its critical partition. To summarize, real-time tasks must meet deadlines. Schedulers ensure that all tasks meet their deadlines. They may also take into account factors such as power consumption or resource contention. The assignment of priorities allows designers to tell the scheduler the importance of tasks. We also use other structures such as criticality and partitions to manage the design of complex embedded systems.